Welcome to another episode of our conversations we're having here at Access to Perspectives. And welcome back, Martin. I'm so glad you agreed to join me again on record for yet another conversation from one podcaster to another. Um, so everyone meet again, Martin De La Hanti. Um, yeah. And yeah, so welcome again. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Joe. And it's really nice to be back on your podcast program. And uh, I've taken a bit of a sojourn from my Inspiring STEM podcast, but we've got a, a few lined up now for this month. So I'll, I'll be back on the airway waves alongside your Access to Perspectives podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll probably be covering similar similar uh, topics, uh, such as the topic we're going to talk about today. Um, so yes, looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, and I saw the announcement that you made, um, like for the next season, if I may say so, or the next rounds of of episodes that's coming from Inspiring STEM. And I find it actually inspiring. And as you said, we have a lot of shared interests, and yet we have each of us have have a different approach and a different background in what we've done with our careers so far. And uh, like the, I think the, what's the word, the common denominator, said the, the term, is our interest in passion for open science and the opportunities and the technologies and the people and stakeholder groups. And yeah, and making these accessible to a wider audience and listenership. And in that sense, the, the conversations we're having in each our con podcast are, might seem similar, but are still, highly different in the nature and thus highly complementary. So yeah, so very inspiring. Thanks for doing this show. Thank you. And yes, we, we have mutual objectives in ad advancing best practices in open science and open publishing practices and uh, sharing insights into particularly innovators that are working hard to do, do the right thing. Mm. Uh, and doing very interesting things at the same time. So world is world exclusive, the Inspiring STEM podcast uh, kicking off for, for this month and this year will feature some very prominent Australian scientists and uh, people involved with advancing science communications and open access mm. from Australia. So That's not a look good out for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already... Uh... What's the word? Like geared up for listening in. So today's topic is the famous and infamous chat GPT developed and presented to all of us by a company called OpenAI. And AI is not new to academia and scholarship, or it's mostly deployed by the corporate publishers um, for all kinds of um facilitating things like um, finding and recruiting reviewers for the quality assessments of the journals mm -hmm. and you probably know more from the insights and the use of AI in, in scholarly publishing in particular and so yeah but now we have this chatbot and is it a chatbot is a what is it like what's the term that can easily define what we're looking at mm -hmm. and using is it Generative text tools. So that's uh, as as we all cannot avoid the the noise and the interest and the um, trepidation around Chat GPT. It's mm -hmm. important also to try and understand what exactly it is and mm -hmm. what it isn't. And I, I, along with other people, are just beginning to really get under the surface, under the hood of what it is. Um, but I think, as we'll we'll talk about in this conversation, you know, at at the end of the day, it's it's just another tool, and it's one of many many tools that might have uh, machine learning or text mining ability, automated tools, but it still requires human intervention. So, it it happens that Chat GPT has had a extraordinary global lens on it, mm -hmm. uh, partly because I would say they have spent time, money, and effort in promoting that. Uh, and the, the, the financial support, which is quite extraordinary behind it at the moment, really emphasizes the, the need to push it out to as wide an audience as possible 
for all of us who are interested to try and break it because like any new software tool or service, it's in the interest of the uh, producer to make sure that it's tested to its nth limit. And that's what chat GPT is experiencing right now. We are testing it to try and break it, to try and find flaws, to feedback what we like, what we don't like. And all that will then feed into OpenAI's development of chat GPT version four. So right now we've got version 3.5. And then it makes you wonder, well, what where was version one? What happened to version one? Because I certainly didn't pick up on, on version one. But looking back now, you can see that it was originally launched. A version one was launched in 2018. So it's been up and running for four years. It's been building up its cap capability. And now we've got this big burst of global interest uh, across every sector, not just science or business, but the, the arts and humanities as well, which is really interesting. And um, Microsoft have uh, invested $10 billion, $10 billion in open AI and chat GPT. Wait a minute, can to... you just say that again? Like what 10 billion? You already said it twice, but it's like, it's a number and an amount and of money that is really difficult. Like what, what are other it's... things that get an equal amount of financial investment? <laughs> like 10 billion, it's just, it's like, a Western country's state capital, or what? Is it? Yeah, there are extraordinary amounts of money, but um, and and obviously you know you've got billions invested in Twitter, courtesy of Mr. Musk. Mm. But uh, ten ten billion for for Microsoft is as an investment would be, yeah, significant but not extraordinary investment mm. for them. But it just shows that the the interest uh, and the, the the developing the capability, the motivation is there for companies like Microsoft to to make you know mm -hmm. make make it work and make make it work better. And you know you'll you'll follow lots of you know people who are much more uh, tech savvy than me talking about the the ins and outs of AI and AI industries. Mm -hmm. But you know one of the uh, postulations is that you know Microsoft are investing in uh, Chat GPT uh, to challenge Google. So we know how you know extraordinarily prevalent Google Google is as a, a search and discovery tool. Mm. Um, it had many competitors at the very beginning of its life, including Bing, which is the Microsoft, which is still going. Mm. So, you know, one assumption might be as part of a, a broader set of, you know, return on investment for Microsoft that uh, ChatGPT might become the challenger and serve, you know, uh, take over from, from Google. Um, so it's, it's not billed at the moment as a search tool, mm -hmm. but you can see how there's potential there for it to become a search tool. Yeah, I think it takes Google or the, the way we search the internet for information to the next level in it being a semantic approach and connecting dots, which sometimes it fails in. Maybe also highlight that where many people have been asking it questions where it actually um, brought up references and, and put the information together that makes sense. And in many instances also just made up like fabricated information and that's highly misleading. Yeah, so in that sense, I think we can appreciate like how it's not only listing sources of information, but also contextualizing, which is coming closer to the human, to how the human brain works and likes to be informed as what we know from conversations. So it's actually a conversational inform information sharing approach. Mm -hmm. And I think it also asks from the person who puts the query to have a certain amount of context um, knowledge to ask an informed question so that it can produce a meaningful response. Uh, mm. So that's interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we all agree that the fabrication approach is still a huge flaw and should be treated with high, like with caution. And whenever 
I think a good practice that we can build trying to find solutions to the to the gaps that we find along the way. I think a practice that some or how these flaws were discovered is when people were asking, oh, that sounds interesting. Can you give me the source for that? And then the chatbot replied, oh, sorry, there's no source. I actually fabricated that. And then actually also apologizing. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah. And that's how we can then easily, like, we should always add that question, like, give me information about this and also cite the sources that you're using. Yeah. I don't know. So it's it as a generative tool. It's not uh, it's not parsing information that is out there, not representing synopses um, or chunked down information that's out there. It's generating new text based yeah. on underlying <clears throat> data sets. So, for example, a, a, a big part of its data set, of which there are. It's it's now getting up to trillions of documents all across the web that are freely accessible. So Wikipedia is one data set, so it, it draws upon Wikipedia. But it's teaching and learning itself to present information that is that's but that makes sense. And the that means at that uh, currently to make sense of maybe three or four sets of uh, conclusions that GPT might make around a, a search or a question, um, it's learned through uh, moderators. And there are human moderators that have tested version one, two, and three, and asked chat GPT to produce three or four responses or however many. And then it's the human intervention saying, well, actually that makes sense or that doesn't make sense. And they're tagging it, mm -hmm. so there is a human tag behind all of this. It's mm -hmm. not it's not a sentient AI, and uh, you may have seen also, you know, it, in terms of that modern moderation, uh, there's that that level of moderation to say this makes sense. You know, a human being would make sense of this or not make sense of that, and then there's the other moderation to filter out what is you know potentially, you know. Uh, Races, sexes, whatever on you know what's that, what's out there on the web, and again they they have human moderations to do that as they do, you know, we're used to do on Twitter, and um, you know for example they employed two hundred uh, people in Nairobi just to filter the the data sets and remove anything that was you know unsavory from that data set. So there are still human beings involved behind this tool. And then when we get to using it, we mm. should always just see it as a tool. Mm. But clearly it has the potential for malevolent purposes because it's such an easy tool to use, for example, to create what looks like and feels like original scientific research paper. This is mm -hmm. where you're now getting the responses from from Nature and Science Magazine, who have already very quickly moved to putting out new guidelines for how to acknowledge use of ChatGPT mm. uh, if it's used as a tool to support, as you might use Google or you might might use um, Grammarly or some, you know, some yeah. lit literature tool. It mm. it should just be listed as a tool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the nature and science have put together these ground rules rules for use of ChatGPT, uh, and they're they're very aware that you know everybody, including scientists and others, are diving into using ChatGPT and mm -hmm. seeing you know how how it can be used for good, but also for bad. So you know, clearly, there's there's uh, there's a case here for more prevalent creation of paper mills by using this technology. You know, at the mm -hmm. moment, there's good studies around fraudulent paper mills that create uh, papers that are plagiarized from other papers. And there are software tools that just parse a full eight page article and then chunk it down to four pages and then it slips. It's mm -hmm. the same paper, but it's been summarized. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and the tools are already prevalent out there to do that. And this is one tactic for mm. these malevolent paper mills to submit to journals. Mm. And they're not uh, not picked up by Authenticate or other tools. So they could they go under the wire because... Yeah. Uh, plagiarism, check. Yeah. But again, chat GPT is not... Uh, uh, doesn't have potential for plagiarism. So be, it's it's creating new text. Um, it's not plagiarizing or chunking down or parsing uh, content that's already out there. But it might um, be great. Um, and the notion that you mentioned of people, because there have been, in, there have been in, inquiries for papers being submitted to list chat GPT as a co-author. And that's when the publishers were put to the corner in having to make a decision if they wanted it or not coming up with. Yeah, it's just treated to what it is. It's a tool, nothing more, nothing less. Yes. And I think as much as we now have a taxonomy for author contribution with such versatile tools at hand, we should probably have a similar taxonomy to specify to what degree the tool was deployed to create the paper exactly yeah yeah, yeah. and uh yeah you know, as far as far as i know there are four research articles or uh, academic uh, journal articles that credit um uh, an ai tool as a co-author and then more recently uh chat gpt uh, there's a, a journal called nurse education practice and it wasn't an original research paper, it was an editorial, but it credited along with the human author, Chat GPT. So of course, that created a lot of noise. You know, there's no such thing as bad promotion. So everybody's talking about nurse education and practice now. So it's a very good journal published mm -hmm. by Elsevier. Very good journal, but you know, obviously everybody's focused on that, saying, well, how, yeah. how can you have uh, an AI tool as a co-author? And I think they let it run for a while because why not? Because you're getting a lot of, you know, attention to that specialist journal. Mm. But I've just got a, a quote just on the screen here from just looking at it recently that the uh, the journal's editor-in-chief said actually that this credit for ChatGPT slipped through in error and it was an oversight on their part. Now, okay. Not too sure about that, but well, um, I mean the journals <laughs> have their own editorial board, so to some degree also make their own decisions irrespective of the yeah. publisher's mm -hmm. policies, mm -hmm. or they might have different varieties of editorial mm -hmm. freedom within a certain publisher, for mm -hmm. uh, yeah, interesting. But what I what I like about Chat GPT and and the a whole range of discussions around chat GP is that it's throwing lenses again back on long-standing problems mm -hmm. so long-standing problems around research integrity in, in publishing um you know in the last number of years uh, there have been quite a number of papers around um gift authorship so this is where you know an academic academics will will write will will do an experiment uh write up a paper and then they may be asked by their head of department or some learned academic who's had no involvement in the, the research to be credited on the paper. So gift authorship is still very, very prevalent mm. and it raises the, you know, the, the standard accountability for being a, an author on a scientific research paper. And I liked um, Magdalena Skipper, who's editor in chief for Nature. She, in response to ChatGPT, but you know, she reiterated the the standards for authorship and said that I quote her: uh, "An attribution of authorship carries with it accountability for the work, which cannot be effectively applied to uh, learning machines," mm -hmm. um, and authors using these tools in any way while developing a paper should document their use in the methods or acknowledgements if appropriate. Mm. And so that 
that's good to throw back the the lens on what it is to be an author and to be accountable for the work mm -hmm. but that has been a long long-standing issue and then I work quite closely with medical publication professionals and medical writers um, who have tried to move forward from the stigma of of ghost authorship where communications agencies and medical writers um, will write on behalf of uh, uh, an academic or a lead investigator on a paper and aren't acknowledged as an author. So um, there's now a, a set of standards, which has been longstanding over 10 years, good publication practice guidelines, which very eloquently and in detail states the accountability and requirements for an author. And so that means that what we have now in the publication of clinical trial papers supported by medical writers who do a fantastic job that where a medical writer has put a significant effort into the writing of the paper or maybe looking at the uh, the data from the research uh, distilling the data making conclusions working with the academic that they're credited as an author mm. so you've sort of gone away from that uh, stigma of um, uh, goes to show up in lack of transparency. But I'm new to the concept of ghost authorship and I'm, I'm aware of the issue of um, paper mills where, where the, I mean, it's also a term that's highly judgmental, but maybe it's also a service that's highly needed within academia and there's just not enough resources to cover up for that. So of course, things like that happen that some services like writing a paper or contextualizing the information that's been gathered as in research output is now being um, has to be written up and why not delegate that and then the researcher can still proofread and how the I don't know if paper yeah. mills would do that with integrity there wouldn't be paper mills they would be service entities which might be corporate or non-profit whichever way but they they would follow uh, some sort of revenue system and being beneficial for the academic mm -hmm. uh, machinery at large. So I think these fraudulent practices are to be seen as fraudulent are often born out of necessity and the gaps and the pressure points um, that then lead to gaps in, in within the system as we know it, because there never before or it keeps growing like the amount of papers that are being published per in a day around the world, it's just insane. So we need more personal, more expertise, more professionalism to tackle all of these aspects and what it means to produce research output in whichever way. Um, so yeah, so what's the, but the question was like, what are, what is ghost authorship? And would that then refer to academics sometimes within the same research group who write the paper but don't get acknowledgement because they're too junior or too off the actual research project's execution to be to be regarded as an author or what what's what's what what scenarios can did you see in so go, go go so go so the ship uh again it's 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 a it's a practice that again within clinical trials and medical publications world, you know, we've moved away from very significantly, but it would be where um, an academic is billed as the the author for a paper, but it's actually written by a professional medical writer or a medical communications oh, agency. Okay. And again, mm -hmm. because they're, they're not visible, they're a ghost, mm -hmm. they're not uh, accountable for the work. We're getting paid. But what we have now is we have, uh, we have, medical writing and science communication teams that will work with academics to again either process data uh, help interpret the results as well as formatting the article into uh, something that is you know, a good piece of science communication and that they're acknowledged because then it's fully a transparent process this is an author that's a medical writer with mm -hmm. a either an independent or working with a company, mm -hmm. and that person will be accountable for that work. So particularly for clinical trials publications or any clinical publication, you want all the authors to be accountable for something that potentially can 
indicate a, a new drug or intervention or a management of a, of a disease. And if it's based on uh, poor data or fraudulent data, then the authors are accountable. Right. Uh, so that, that's they, just really, yeah. because the, the, the consequences for getting that wrong are, you know, people will die. And, you know, the, lots of examples of that in the, you know, in subjects like mathematics and physics, uh, hopefully nobody's going to die because of a, a poor paper. But, um, you know, authorship should really be fully transparent. The author should be accountable, should be able to stand behind the data, uh, be queried around the data in the paper uh, and take full credit. So to your point as well, if they're, you know, early career researchers working with senior academics and they're doing the work and they're not credited, well, that's, that's, that's not good. Yeah. Uh, they should have full accountability for their contribution. And again, I would point people to the um, uh, good publication practice is abbreviated to GPP. Uh, it was updated last year. So it's called GPP 20. 22 if you google that you'll find that it's relevant for medical writers and those working on clinical publications mm -hmm. but very very detailed set of guidelines uh attribution accreditation for for authors what it is to be an author and uh you know i'd really like to see more of that across all academic sciences mm -hmm. and social sciences humanities where they're publishing where again authors are fully accountable but for that, we also have COPE, right? The Committee for Publication Ethics. Is that complementary or is it more or less the same what they postulate? That, that's complementary. Uh, so again, that, that has, uh, for a long while, given guidelines on what it is to be an author. And then we have, again, from a clinical world perspective, the uh, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors have always had very clear uh, and explicit guidelines on what it is to be an author and how authors should be mm -hmm. accredited and attributed to papers. Which means again, like an AI cannot be an author because it can't be held accountable. And uh, also, so, it shouldn't, even if it could be, but it shouldn't be because it's a machine, it's human made. And if anyone, the people or the company represent or have their build and contributed to that AI should be held accountable. So we still need human beings to, in the worst case, yeah, we so, yeah. sue them because we can't sue a, an algorithm. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. the consequence would ban it, but I don't know. As long as, yeah, anyways, okay, let's not, um, like assuming the best intentions and also seeing the benefits that it brings to the table like we already highlighted as like potential or actual downfall or down downsides are can fabricate information you should all always anyways even if it's human only made or claimed you should always treat information with caution and mm. having seen now that like chat gpt actually also apologizes in the second and third iteration for having fabricated and not telling us up front <laughs> but it's funny and cute but it's still a machine <laughs> um or um an algorithm some sort so yeah um okay what else so what are the use cases in academia that we see other than okay it can produce contribute to papers but it should be mentioned under the methods part maybe or yeah maybe under the methods part extending the methods to the actual paper writing process where it's been mentioned, not only the experiments, but also the paper writing has made use of JTPT for the purpose of, mm. and then been humanly vetted against by the team who's actually listed as co-authors and co-contributors. Exactly. And I think actually where it, it can and will be a legitimate and very, very helpful tool is for authors of, complex original research papers who are then asked to produce a scientific summary, plain language summary mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that the, the 
the objectives and the output from the work are communicated to a wide audience beyond just the scientific research community, if it's a scientific yeah, research brilliant. paper, where it can be communicated to the, the public, to policymakers, to government, mm -hmm. and is understandable. Yeah. So, uh, the, again, coming from a you know clinical and, and medical point of view, the about the last 10 years, um, uh, the, 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 the grouping of um, those stakeholders involved in medical communications have been looking at developing plain language summaries and advancing mm -hmm. the development of plain language summaries to ensure that they're you know, at the optimal level for communication to a particular audience. Um, again, defining your audience as patients or government or policy makers, there will be different levels of uh, vocabulary that you will use to communicate uh, optimally to those three. So chat GPT would be a perfect tool to say, mm -hmm. from this complex original research paper, from its learning across trillions of sets of data, mm -hmm please produce a 250 word plain language summary that will make sense to a patient or another one that makes sense to a government policymaker. Mm -hmm. I think that will be hugely valuable because that still is a bit of a challenge is to, to get the, the tone and the language right. Yeah. It's, and, it's, um, yeah. It's an enormous challenge and I think as scientists, we have been untrained or we have unlearned how to communicate with common people. Oh, sorry. We are all common people in one way or the other. But I mean, others are specialists in other things, like non-academic ones. Okay, um, It's getting worse the more I try to <laughs> rectify my wording. But so what's concerned is, or what's commonly known as lay summaries. Um, but yeah, as to, to make the... Like, I think researchers have been punished towards thinking it has to sound very technical to be scientifically valuable information or whatever, or to be, to be seen as scientific information. So we've unlearned to communicate with other societal stakeholders, what I was trying to say. Hmm. And for that, I agree, yeah, it's brilliant because we're, we're currently um, still doing a project with Eric Archive where we translate English, research articles, first also by African researchers across disciplines. And we thought we would translate at least the, the, the abstracts and maybe some parts of the introduction into, into African, extra mm -hmm. African languages, like indigenous mm -hmm. African languages. Turns out it's not possible because too technical, too, uh, like too many acronyms, too many like topic, research topic specific terminologies. So then a science literacy organization in South Africa took um, to the effort to first produce some like un comprehensible, humanly comprehensible, <laughs> non-scientist comprehensible um, summaries. Uh, and that, yeah, I agree. And that can be nicely done by ChatGPT. ChatGPT. Yeah. And, and then being translated into whichever language, which is another passion topic for me that we serve multilingualism better in academia and I think mm -hmm. but, but have you seen any non-English content being produced by ChatGPT or is that for a later stage or a later release of it? I personally haven't but I'm sure that's been tested so I'd be interested like you to to see how that works in practice. Mm -hmm. I know it's being tested I just haven't seen any any discussion around that yeah but even if not there's other ai tools for like na natural language processing algorithms who are mm -hmm. already quite powerful not for all the languages we have but for you know a good number like in the 10 like 10 20 languages can be relatively well mm -hmm. translated mm -hmm. back and forth for lay summaries mm -hmm. that because we have enough digitized content through, thanks to Wikipedia and other standardized um, uh, text bodies online. 
Mm -hmm. um, and another use case I see would be nice for it to embark on is producing reviews on research topics. Yes. Yes. Where because that was I something see. I was very passionate about, about as a PhD student, like digging into a research topic, learning the 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 uh, like the variety of thought processes that goes into research topics, the complexity of viewpoints of methodological approaches you can take on it, the yeah, the whole yeah, I mean the the branches it also reaches out to and then the conclusions researchers from different labs and, and groups make about a certain topic with a specific approach. And to summarize that, I think uh, yeah. ChatGPT is much better off than an individual researcher or even a group of researchers because it can just better process information. And then the group of researchers can again go in and verify the information that's been produced by the, yeah. Yeah. By the algorithms. I'm I'm using plural, assuming it's a combination of algorithms that are going to action. But again, I'm not a tech person <laughs> by training. So I agree. I I think you'll see a a, a range of text enabled tools, oh. not just ChatGPT, but other text enabled tools that will facilitate, as you were just describing. You know, doing a stage of the art review for an author is always huge burden because it's a huge amount of effort mm. and you want to make sure that you're comprehensive in your view of the the references that you're you're searching and, yeah. and, and then again, referencing. yeah and then to conclude on the well what i also wanted to add to this is like then the reviewer team the actual researchers or individual researcher who summarizes the topic or who has then chat gpt summarize the topic can go in and yeah, just verify the sources, make draw their own conclusion from the information presented, and also the expertise he or she um, or them bring to the topic. Um, mm. And yeah, and I think this can be a very nice approach and like also verifiable and applicable to a wider community. Within, well, hopefully, generally accepted as a way forward in academia. I think it will help to make sense of all the niche topics, the huge topics that we now see with molecular medicine mm -hmm. and and also the solution oriented topics that we need to make sense of, like all the research being produced with climate research. And then summarizing that into meaningful analysis of what do we actually know about climate, about the climate today and how can we intervene to mm -hmm. save the planet from us. Basically, I think for that it can be really useful. Yes, yes, chat GPT. Let's just be cautious as we use it. <laughs> Thoughtful. Well, I, I think uh, again, it's nice to see that OpenAI, the company producing chat GPT, are reactive and responsive to what we're all talking about now, which is you know mostly the negatives, and. Uh, they've reacted, for example, they've produced their antidote to malevolent use of chat GPT, which they're calling AI text classifier. Mm -hmm. And this is following uh, OpenAI having weeks long discussions with uh, schools and colleges in the United States over the fact that now chat GPT can write on anything and where students are doing essays and having essay based work that they're clearly using chat GPT to, mm. to do those essays. Why wouldn't they? Um, so they chat open AI have created the, uh, the antidote to that AI text classifier, which is meant to just, uh, verify if a piece of text has been produced via chat GPT, but mm. yeah, they've, they've already said that that just cannot be foolproof, but they're willing to work to ensure the integrity of the use of the tool and to create other tools and services that will support you know, what, whatever area is currently you know, using chat GPT and wanting to use it for, for positive reasons. Mm. Um, and they, you know, they made it very clear that at the moment, because 
it's not foolproof. It gets things it gets things wrong that it shouldn't be solely relied upon for making any kind of decisions. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, okay, where to go next? There's so many topics. Okay, so oh, another thing, another AI I would like to bring to the discussion is site.ai, as in citation mm. helper. The idea from the founders uh, was and still is, and is very useful as such, the more people use it. Um, to weigh the citations and measure if they're actually supportive of the research presented or contradictory, mm -hmm. which serves very well the idea of scientific discourse, which I think we've lost sight of with being paper producers first and not well having kind of lost patience to actually listen to each other and have discussions and discourses around also accepting that other research in other parts of the world or even if it's in the same institute might have another conclusion from what they observe in the experimental outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of having a conversation about how did you go about and what did you see doing what and what did we see doing what and how can we all make sense of what we see as a result instead of claiming that they are wrong and we are right, like we can say that we did. Anyways, so side AI is trying to make sense in that regard. And now they've also jumped to action, helping, trying to help to fill the gap that was um, was uh, shown to exist um, by ChatGPT in the sense of, is there an actual citation for this claim? <laughs> And I think they just announced on LinkedIn that they're going to release it soon, that they're kind of on it as we speak, thankfully. And they're probably also not the only ones who are trying to find ways to work with ChatGPT in a way that's meaningful and also to course correct the mistakes that are happening as it's not perfect. It's not a perfect tool. And I, I just love David Boy's music, but also for him to be cited as having said, if it works, it's out of date. So let's just appreciate that as a fact. Um, mm -hmm. And again, because it's like human made, humans are not perfect and that's okay. And anything human made cannot be perfect by its very nature because it's made by humans. And we are all biased, each of us. Mm -hmm. Anyways, so yeah. So have you seen other, um, other organizations jumping to action in response? other than open AI themselves also. And as such, well, another... we're creating a nice ecosystem and yeah, collaborating and making this a meaningful endeavor. Yes, and uh, again, there's been so much talk about chat GPT and you know, we are sort of embedded in a, uh, a science research ecosystem, the science communications ecosystem, but outside of that, then other, other industries have been sort of worrying, you know, will will we be replaced by chat GPT? Uh, and, uh, you know, an example which I quite like is uh, um, from musician Nick Cave, mm -hmm. uh, formerly of the, the Bad Seas. He lived in Berlin for a number of years. Also, and um, David Bowie as well. So Berlin seems to be uh, a sort of inspiration. Featured in one of my favourite films, Wings of Desire, if oh, you've no. seen that. Also no, based I'm in putting it down. Vin Vim Wenders, oh my goodness, it's it's a it's a fantastic film based in Berlin. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's an, another story. But uh, Nick Cave uh, did respond to uh, comments. He runs a, a a blog and he's very active on responding to to fans and anybody else who poses some questions. So one fan used ChatGPT to generate a song in the style of Nick Cave. Oh, I saw that. So, I saw the headline. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. So you know, the concern then amongst, you know, musicians will be, is is our time up? Is this just going to be, you know, uh, chat GPT is going to, you know, create music and, you know, write lyrics and songwriters will become obsolete. Well, mm. you know, he, uh, he was very polite in response to, 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 the fan 
but called ChatGPT a travesty. <laughs> um, <laughs> he said, ChatGPT Chat might be able to write a speech or a sermon or a obituary, but it cannot create a genuine song. Mm. And what he says is, uh, if any of you know Nick Cave, then you, you'll you'll resonate with this, but I'll just quote him. I've just got it on the screen here. He says, songs arise out of suffering, by which I mean they are predicated upon the complex internal human struggle of creation. And well, as far as I know, algorithms don't feel. Data doesn't suffer. Chat GPT has no in inner being, has been nowhere, has endured nothing. Uh, it has not the audacity to reach beyond its limitations and hence doesn't have the capacity for a shared transient experience. It has no limitations from which to transcend. Mm -hmm. Amazing words from a poet and a lyricist, not a novelist. Mm -hmm. um, that that in itself could not be generated by chat GPT, but mm -hmm. he makes an important point there. Again, it is a tool. And where you get into the creative arts, at the moment, you know, whether it's text and you know, writing lyrics, songs, novels, poems, it's it's not going to do a good job because it doesn't reflect the the inner turmoil or creative instinct of the person. Yeah, the human and, part and the the heart and soul that artists put into their works it cannot cannot be plagiarized or copied or or recreated no. by a uh, algorithm. Kind of. Yeah, so um, again, lots and lots of really good discussion. I mean, you can maybe not fail to get a bit tired of all the chat GPT discussion and people trying it out mm -hmm. and then, you know, publishing you know, long, long trains of te text from chat GPT. But it does, does again, make us focus on things that matter and have mattered for a long time, mm -hmm. just makes us to to refocus on those things and maybe look to using chat gpt and other similar ai tools text mining tools mm -hmm. image creation tools as just tools but mm -hmm. to make sure that they're accredited in you know if it's a scientific or academic paper that it's accredited in the methodology it's very clear that we've used this tool as well as we've used you know mm -hmm. you know uh, a reference manager tool etc mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, also to be specific around the, what's the word, the, the brand behind the service, because that also matters in how transparent or intransparent the processes are. And like not judging that as a matter of fact, but just to point out we're using this tool by that manufacturer, end of the story. And only then it's comparable if it's transparent or not, or open source or not. Because as I remember from my work as a PhD student in the molecular biology lab, we would reference in the methods part, we were using <clears throat> a bit to extract DNA mm -hmm. from what? But then you have to be specific what kit in, 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 yeah, in particular, what like what from what manufacturer and also from what charge of year when it was produced, because mm. that might also mm. make them influence the experiment because products are always being developed further. And you you can't compare an experiment that has been conducted with um, solutions produced by different manufacturers or vendors, in different parts of the world in different years of production. Like it's just not comparable. Mm. Mm. Prob most probably influences the outcome of the experiment. Same with, with this now. Oh, so interesting. And as we use them, so uh, and we, we had a few exchanges before this recording. And I just want to, uh, I've, I've also registered, but I haven't actually used it because I, and then also um, now it's it's not accessible as much anymore because so many people are trying to, mm -hmm. to use ChatGPT yeah. and, and it hits server capacity. But um, it's just be mindful of what um, what data we're sharing as we use it and what devices we're accessing it from. So basically a gentle reminder of checking the terms of service. Um, yes. Because that is a, is a tool and we comply with the terms of service by the producers of that tool. 
in using it. Um, and there is like for OpenAI, they make it explicit that they do share the information that is being recorded or that they capture from your browser or our browser history and mm. corporate information that's accessible through the internet if you're using it from your workplace. So it might also have secondary consequences as we as we happily jump yeah. on the opportunity mm -hmm. and are curious to check it out and also mm -hmm. to proof correct. But there is a whole, well, not a long list, but there are some other measures for caution to be considered. Mm -hmm. <sighs> um, yeah, so I feel like it's it's been, or I'm a bit brain fried now because we've already <laughs> many topics. Is there some some other aspects you would like to highlight today? I can, well, I can leave you with, um, you know, I think a, a very positive and quite smart approach from a college professor in the United States, the the Wharton School, and this this struck me as you you know rather than being in fear of chat gpt and similar tools uh trying to ban it block it not allow it mm. uh, this professor has been quite smart in already establishing guidelines for his students and a policy a formal policy in the in the college handbook and what he says is and i'll quote here um i expect you to use ai chat gpt and image generation tools at a minimum in this class in fact some assignments will require it learning to use ai is an emerging skill and i provide tutorials in canvas about how to use them i'm happy to meet and help with with these tools during office hours or after class so he is taking he's embracing these technologies realizing that these genies are out of the bottles there's nothing really you can do about them they're out there and rather than seeing them as a negative, seeing as a, a positive and encouraging, and actually here he says, I expect you to use AI in this class. Mm -hmm. And you know, he will provide training and learning about using the tools. And I think this is you know, so important is to educate around use of these tools in what circumstances they, they can be used. Um, and beware beware of the limitations as well you know you just threw a huge ball in, in, into my corner because as i shared with you i am building an online academy for researchers and research departments or groups to sign up to and i just i i hear the call to action like now that we've talked about the possible use cases within academia mm. scholarly writing and publishing it's actually, yeah, so I'm I'm taking this on to put together some training tutorials on how to use ChatGPT in particular or other AIs for that matter. Mm. What are the pros and cons and opportunities and then how to use them purposefully and cautiously or with as much caution as necessary, feasible. There's always a trade-off anyways, but to be as informed about the potential pitfalls as feasible mm. for the time being. So yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> That's another another to do item on my uh, ever growing to do list. <laughs> I think I'm right. This <laughs> one. Good. Mm. Okay, so I'm sure that then we meet again um, in in this show or yours, the inspiring Sam. Please, everyone, go over to the link in the show notes to explore. The past is already a long list of highly informative conversations that you can find in Martin's um, podcast show with um, yeah representatives from within academia across the spectrum, um, mostly concerned with open science as well. Oh, and the last thing, because you, you mentioned to me in the preparation of this episode um, that you queried ChatGPT for, can you, so what did you ask? the machine to produce about open science? I asked uh, ChatGPT to uh, tell me about the, the current and future trends in open science. Wow. And mm -hmm. it produced a very, very nice, 
uh, two page uh, summary of everything that I would have picked out as a as a consultant. So I guess I'm slightly concerned that my my job will become redundant. But uh, wow. um, it's again about the inter interpretation of that data. But it made a, a very good case for open science. Talked about fair data. Everything that you know you and I would would cover and you know colleagues advancing open science it did a good job of that and you know I can see myself using it as a, a, a way of drafting a piece of report or mm. a, a study and then I will need to interpret it and stand behind it if I'm authoring oh. it um, particularly if I'm choosing for a client as well so yeah that's the accountability part so that's fair yes Yes. And uh, there'll be so many more conversations around just chat GPT, but it'd be quite nice when uh, whoever is having these conversations that we broaden the discussion beyond just chat GPT, because there are you know, mm. hundreds of similar tools that are out there that are already being used uh, mm. and can be used for you know, positive benefit in whatever circumstances. Mm. And educating around these tools, as that professor at the the Wharton School is doing, is you know actually helping to to make best use of these tools within a particular circumstance or scenario. Mm. And yeah, you will you will see plenty of webinars and conference presentations over the next next number of months. Um, I'm. I've just just been invited to talk about AI and ChatGPT at the in Institute of Professional Editors of Australia and New Zealand in May. So Are you we'll traveling a... down south? Oh, it's okay. On it's it's an online damn conference. okay. I mean, better for yes. the planet, but <laughs> would have been nice to be down under again. And I, I did take have, a second. I would have envied I you. I took a second look, yeah, but no, it's online. Yeah. Well. Awkward presentation hours. Then good luck. <laughs> uh, but but yeah. I'm going to I'm going to Prague also in May to present in person at the European Medical Writers Association, nice. and we'll be talking about AI, te AI technologies there as well. Oh, that's lovely. I haven't been to Prague in well, it's not too long ago, a couple of years. We have just driven through that time, but it's such a beautiful city. Yeah. So yeah. So we're here. For for you listeners will hear more from us on the topic, both of us, for sure, moving forward. So thank you so much for joining okay. again. And I'm sure we will have other top shared. Well, we do have a lot of shared interests. So there'll be more episodes to come where we can um, join in one or the other podcast show. Thanks so much, Martin. It's always a pleasure having you and discussing with you also as well. Thank you, Joe. And likewise, a pleasure for me. And uh... I look forward to the next opportunity to chat and we perhaps will have you on the Inspiring STEM podcast in a few weeks time so we can reciprocate our conversation. Keep the conversation going, which is always nice. Yeah, always. So thanks for that and see you soon.